is Charter House on Mendip, which is a, a lead mining area, uh, and zinc, they were mining there as well. And you can see the Roman Amphitheatre and a rectangular enclosure down here. So for the average person, the general population of Somerset, they don't really think much about their Roman heritage. It's not something that's in your mind. But underneath the ground in Somerset, there are a lot of sites, small towns, lots of villas, and others. This is a map. And Ilchester, the small town, is one of the... Mm. Ah, brilliant, you're a star. Um, <laughs> okay. top one. Yeah, top one. Anyone who goes to sleep will get talking. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, Ilchester is a small Roman town. Uh, Bath used to be in Somerset. Obviously now it's um, Bath and North East Somerset, I think it's called. Um, and then Camerton, a small town. Childhouse or Mendip, a small town. Shepton Mallet, note with one T. I spelt it with two T's when I did the first map for a little book I wrote on a board, and the director of museum service in Somerset took me to task for this um, in quite a vociferous way, got to spell it right. And when I was going to give a lecture on Froome and Froome itself about three or four years ago, I was walking around the town beforehand, and I came to the uh, signposts and the road towards Shepton Mallet. And the signpost on the left had Shepton Mallet spelt with, as it is here, one T. Mm -hmm. And the signpost on the right had it spelled with two T's. That's a French word. And I took a photograph of this and I said to them, I said, if you lot in Somerset can't spell it like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's another Roman settlement. And then Old Salem or Salisbury over here is another one where the geeks will learn more and more about. And the finds that your contemporaries uh, in Wiltshire are getting is beginning to give us more insight into Old Salem, Salisbury area. And Froome is not a Roman town of sorts, but the Horde is quite close to the Roman road to the south of Froome. But it's within an area, when I drove from Salisbury up to Froome to give a lecture, um, this is going back some time, I did all my initial work, my research work in the 80s and 90s on coins in Wiltshire, and almost every single Wiltshire village along here, because this is right on the border, 5,000 coin hoard, 5,000 coin hoard, it's coin hoard alley, all the way along to Froome. And these are all villas and big settlements. We've just had a new villa discovered in Wilton where a lot of those eggs have been found. So there is a lot of villas in here. So what they're not seeing is what's under the ground. So um, then, Dave Crisp, 2010, somewhere near the site, and he's finding lots of these. Anyone here got a great Roman silica? They're not common in Hertfordshire. I happen to know there's about 36 of them on the database. <coughs> Unless you can tell me otherwise. There's two here that I'm giving back yeah. to me. Okay, they're, they're not common in Hertfordshire. And you know there's not one Roman coin board from Hertfordshire of these coins. There are about 150 of these hoards from Britain, and not one from Hertfordshire. As I've always said, you turn your machines on, it helps. Now, you don't like that kind of thing. <laughs> right, the, um, so these are coming up across the field. He's getting one at a time. And he gets in the end, he's got about 62 there, it's almost 100 now in fact, because since then he's been finding more. And we discovered in the archives in Taunton that a hoard of this lot was found on the same farm in the uh, 1860s, and that that hoard has the same late date, or last, last coin date, TPQ as we call it, of 394 as these ones. And it's a very unusual last date for this period. So almost certainly what he's getting is a spread from a hoard that was first found in the Victorian period because they didn't have metal detectors then, so they couldn't get the outliers. And anyway, he was going along until he got what is a very iffy signal, so Roger Bland, who spoke earlier this year to you, uh, is standing. And he didn't think he was going to dig it up initially. He thought, you know, what's the point? But it might be one of these silicite on its edge. Now, what does the coin sound like on its edge? Sort of I don't know why it's anyway, but it didn't sound good. But anyway, when he got down to there on his arm with a little handheld detector, it was going wild. And he was pulling out bits of clay because he went down into the subsoil. And he came up with some bits of pop, and then the next handful of bits of pop and a few round green things and a few more, and he realized he had a coin board. He had about 20 coins and some pottery. So I'd been at his club in Melksham. That previous autumn, and he's a wag, Dave Chris, and he had a couple of friends who were quite a wag, and we had a lot of good banter. And there was a big hoard found in Wiltshire called the Kinetic Hoard in the 1970s, 
and the Connecticut Road was ripped out of the ground, both containers of coins mixed up. It was a nightmare story. It's not one I want to go into. The coins themselves are in the British Museum now and whatever, but the archaeology got pretty well destroyed. And so I just said to him and his two mates, I said, you get another Connecticut Road, you damn well leave it in the ground for a <coughs> down. Um, <coughs> well, what did Dave do? He filled in the hole and walked away. And he contacted his FLO at the time in Wiltshire, because he's a man of Wiltshire, who's Katie, and she's now FLO in Hampshire, who then contacted the FLO then in Somerset, Anna Boo, who's now a doctor, Anna Boo, but she's now come back to the scheme as a MFLO in Suffolk. They all move everywhere. Judy, you stay where you are. Um, and then um, they decided that they would carry out an excavation. And so this shows you the team. This is Steve Minnett, who is the director of museums, who had a go at me about my spelling, and he's a good friend, uh, mm -hmm. with the two FLOs on either side, an ex-FLO for the region, Naomi Payne, and her husband, who are both working the archaeological service, and then Dave and his grandson, who slept on the site for three nights while it was dug up. And here is the end of the first day where the site has been excavated and the pot exposed. Okay, you can see there. And this is the <coughs> archaeologist, Graham, <coughs> who actually led the dig. It's the only photograph we've got of him, which is of, his, of looking at his face. Most of the photographs are his backside for a man, because <laughs> he's, he's done a trench all the time. And if you get an idea of the scale of the pot, it's bigger than his torso. It's a large pot. And it's at this stage, I got a phone call in London. Now, sadly, um, I was supposed to go to a conference in Spain. And it wasn't until the Friday evening that I realized that the Spaniards actually made a mistake. Can you believe they'd organized a conference and sent the wrong dates out to everyone? <laughs> and we all had our phone calls and everything, and then suddenly one person realized that something wrong, or emailed around, so they had to cancel it. So I could have gone down and been there, but I got a phone call, and they said, we've got this very large uh, pot of coins intact in a pot. And I said, great, just lift it out of the ground <laughs> and bring it up to London, that'll be fine. We'll all be happy and we'll excavate it in the, in the lab. To which there was a combination of laughter and bad language at the other end of the phone. <laughs> and they said, but it's a very big pot. And I said, okay, what's the diameter? So they went away and they gave it to me in centimetres. I said, no, I wanted it in inches. And it was 25 inches. The Kinetio board pot, I went and quickly looked in the publication, was 25 and a half inches. So I suddenly realized we were onto something big. And I said, OK. And they said, also, the pot is cracked. You can see here the cracks on the pot. Probably from the tractor going over and plowing, that it was compacting the soil and breaking the pot. Also, because the coils inside were getting saturated with water, any chemists in the room? And the salts of the coins were coming out of the coins, so expanding the mass of the pot and giving it pressure from inside. Combine those two factors, you get a crap pot. So there's no way they're going to get out. The agreement was we would take it out in arbitrary layers. And that's what happened. It came out, and I'll show you in a minute what they did. Uh, this is the process. So you have here the pot at the top. Um, the little dog bowl, which was on top of it, has been taken off now. There was a dog bowl over the top. I'll show you that reconstructed in a minute. And they broke into the pot. And they took it down, layer by layer. And the coins at the top are green. And you've probably all got a Roman coin in the past when it's got that sort of greeny, matty feel to it. And you can rub it with your fingers and you can actually make it a bit clearer. You know the ones with the green ones off? That's what they're like at the top. The ones at the bottom, though, much browner, and they came out in big groups all stuck together. Pretty horrible. Um, and that's because the water had been coming up and down the water table, rising and falling, and the salts from the top coins were going down to the bottom, and then they couldn't escape into the soil, so they were coagulating around the bottom coins and just fusing them all together. Um, it took two days to get all the coins out, and those are the layers. And within layers, there are bags. So for 16, there are a dozen bags. So we have 16, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, all right, 12. And there are in total 60 different bags for all 60 different contexts. And um, for all the unusual emperors and the scarcer coins, they're staying like that. 
for the really common points like tetracus of Victorinus, we're going to actually do them by layer and just let the bags mix up because otherwise we'd be doing a work it out with all the common points, 300 small boards basically, the equivalent of because of the size of the board and there has to be a decision you make. But this layering you're going to see in a minute is incredibly important. It makes a big difference. On Monday, Roger Bland came in and we got the news what was going on over the weekend. And Roger said, what are we going to do? And I said, well, we're going to go and get the coins now. So we drove down in my car on the Monday morning and got them. When I got back to the museum on the fourth day that night, the back of the car was that far off the ground. I had no idea how heavy they were because the pots I was putting in the boxes were the ones with the potting. And they were, everyone else put the coin ones in, it just happened to be where it was. I had no idea. And when we actually weighed all the coins that morning, which we did, all the boxes, it was 160 kilograms. So that's two of you in my boot. <laughs> okay? You can imagine what effect it had. I had to be suing the museum for severe damage to my own suspension. Anyway, we commissioned a geophysical survey which turned up next to nothing. But what I can tell you now is we have had some more work done and I'm going to give you a little brief resume of that later on. Now, the first thing you do when you go to coin and this is one of the reasons why, please, if you get one, let us get it as fast as possible, is that we got the conservation team over. This is Pippa Pierce, Senior Metals Conservator. She and her boss, the head of conservation, came over that morning on Tuesday, <coughs> morning after, and we had a council of course so to speak how to deal with it. And she said, I want all of this lot in my room now. So we have to take the whole lot over. And she gave it what is technically called a, a wash and dry. <coughs> and that means that she washed all the coins in distilled water <coughs> and then dried them in a drying oven. This is the drying oven. And this stabilizes them. It also meant that they separated all of the coins together, which were still wet, while they were wet. Had we waited a few months, those coins would have been inseparable without breaking the coins. So that's why we had to break the coins on the day they came in. That's why the speed of getting them for us is vital. And if you do get a coin on the weekend or whatever and it's wet, you wrap it up well and you put it in your fridge. Don't tip the things out or anything, you put it in your fridge and you call uh, Professor Walters over here yeah. and he will come and pick it up and it gets into us ASAP. I'm sorry about being dogmatic about it, but it's for your good as well. Because we've had one or two coin boards that have come to us, and there's one which in the end ended up in, in Leicester Museum, uh, in Leicester, uh, the museum in Leicestershire, which had a very sorry history, and the coins in the pot mm -hmm. can't get them out. They are absolutely stuck in a big block of metal. Some of them came out from the top layer, so the rest of them you couldn't get out from the sun face. You just can't get them. So they will turn to concrete. It's just a, sorry, I'm not going on a bit, but I'm trying to get over the mess. This is what conservators do too. Professional conservation really does make a difference. I'd never recommend anyone to try and conserve their own coins because um, you can do more damage, and you normally do do more damage. The number of coins I've seen which have been damaged, I'm afraid, is sad. That then Pippa took with her team six weeks to do this work, and each of the bags was then delivered to me and Roger Bland. And this is a typical bag, and we did an emperor cut. So you can see here, I'll give you a test. Uh, Dave, behind me, who's that? Yes. You're awake. Yes. Good. D-R-O-B-U-S. Probus. Probus. This is Probus, Carasius, more Probus, Salonina, Victorinus, another Probus, uh, back of a, of a um, Claudius Gothicus. Uh, all of them here. Loads of animals. <coughs> almost 30 rubies. Gallienus animal. 30 rubies. Are we all right? Sorry? Are we all right on the Indians? Oh, really? Yes. Except for the denarii. Five denarii of him. And one denarius of Victorinus, which is unique. Now, it took us, Roger and me, 10 weeks to do an emperor count. So we did a, an initial emperor count. 11,000 coins were legible. And that gave us an idea of what was going on. But the first thing that was really important to know was who is the last emperor? And it was, of course, our British emperor, Carousius. This is the latest coin in the hall. Well, these are the latest coins in the hall. This one up here. And this is where Carousius' hoards are. A lot in North Wales, for example, in Anglesey. 
And Froome is in an area where there aren't that many. There's a number, more in the southeastern part than there are here. So we immediately could fix it geographically and chronologically, uh, which was good starting. Now, while all this is going on, all sorts of other things are happening. Um, as soon as the hoard comes out of the ground, the first thing you have to do is, where are we going to get this in the end? Where is it going to go? And the decision was made with Steve Minnett in, in Taunton, immediately on day one when Roger and I went down there, this has to go to Taunton Museum. That was an absolute must. So once that was decided, you then think it's going to cost a lot of money to acquire under the Treasure Act. So <coughs> we're going to have to start doing a bit of publicity to raise the awareness. And while all this work was going on, we were, meanwhile, preparing a website, a macro website on our peers, website which Dan Pepp was doing. We were doing various uh, lectures. We were actually, well, I couldn't prove, we had to deal with the press. We had to prepare a coroner's report. Now, the coroner's report um, was prepared, and we agreed with the um, Froome coroner that we would do the announcement of the board on the day of the coroner's inquest, just to avoid any problems. And we said to them, and that was going to be July the 15th, on a Saturday, and we said, we'll do it then, and then we can go public on the same day, and it will all be hunky-dory. So just keep quiet about it, please, until the coroner's inquest. Because someone in the coroner's office sent a note to the local press saying, on the 15th of July, the coroner, Mr. So and so and so and so, will decide whether 52,500 Roman coins found near Peru were treasure. It was just as if no one's going to notice. Mm -hmm. So we got the West press from the West of England beginning to ring us up saying, We're going to go, we're going to tell everyone about this board. And we thought, Well, you can't tell anyone about it because you know nothing about it other than it's got 52,500 coins. But they started to get awkward. So we had to agree to go early. And we'd already been filmed for BBC's Digging Britain. So what we did was, we got the BBC on board and said, look, we're going to have to go early. Will you lead with the story? And then we'll let all the press follow on. So we held off the local press, a bit mean of us, but tough, um, got the BBC in first, and then we were able to do it properly. There was nothing more difficult than having bits and pieces of press releases coming out. And as a result, you saw all this lot of newspaper. It went all around the world. Um, Dan Pepp, as a result of this, only had a few hours to finish the microsite on the board with the blogs by, by the FLOs. And on the day of the inquest, we all went to through. It had already broken. <coughs> and we got down to the library. And it had been announced that from 11 o'clock onwards, the good folk of through could come and see the board. The inquest was at 9.30. So all my colleagues went off to the inquest. And left me, I wasn't going to leave the coins over my dead body, with the coins in the hat to show the public. But of course, Froome, the people in Froome are idiots. The library opens anyway at 9.30. So they were all in the library. A thousand had come through by the time my colleagues got back from the inquest, which went on to 11.30. So we in total had over 2,000 people that day come through. And we were actually, when, when they came back, we were going up and down the queues of people who were trained, showing them coins along the queues. There were so many people there. But we had all the press there too as well. And you can see the TV <coughs> and the rest of it. Um, all part of the publicity campaign. Digging of Britain did a program on it as well. And we got interviewed all over the place. Al Jazeera was my favourite. Um, <laughs> we put a display up in the beer, in the coins gallery, um, rapidly. That's the finder of Victor Ambrose from Time Team who does the reconstructed drawings with some of the board there, just to give people an insight. And in the space of 10 days, Roger and I in Anabu wrote this book, which you can get still. It's pretty cheap, I think, on eBay and places as well. And that helped fundraise for the board. 50 people every book sold went to the board. Um, appealed. So this was all happening at the same time, as Roger and I were counting through all those coins. Uh, it was a pretty um, lengthy process. Then we had a massive campaign of more lectures, more visits to Froome, um, publicity of all sorts to try and raise the money. And by March 2011, we got the 320,000 it was valued at. Half the money went to the finder, Dave. He was brilliant on the fundraising. He really helped. Of course, he was going to get half of it, but he was really <laughs> uh, a nicer guy you wouldn't come across. And uh, the, the landowner has three daughters who just finished university. He would pay up all their university debts in one go. He was thrilled. 
Um, and we also got 100,000 for conservation because um, the, the coins are not in good nick when they came out of the ground. A lot of work was needed on them, and that was enough to conserve 30,000 out of the 52,000. So there's 22,000 not conserved. And I'm now actually leading on the publication. Roger has now, as you know, is leaving the museum. Uh, so uh, it's on my plate. With Vincent, I was telling you, he was helping. Uh, in the autumn of that year, through uh, the museum in Taunton put on display, this is rather misleading because these coin pictures are about that big. They're massive. So they make everything look small. But that pot, I on this display come up to here. Does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. You get, the, get a scale. I should put someone standing next to his case. Mm -hmm. So that is that size. And that's a little dog bowl on the top that is the lid. Okay? That was reconstructed in our own uh, museum as well, in the BF. And the, I say ongoing conservation, I've got some more coins that need to be looked at, especially for ours. But most of it's been finished. And um, a hell of a lot of work they did. And most of the conservation was initially manual. A lot of manual scraping. Uh, you can't just chemical these coins, you destroy them. So, what have we got in here? 52,500 coins, 160 kilograms. And this is the bit you've all been waiting for. This is the initial totals. I'm not going to change this until we come to publication. But these are all the empires, the central empires, the ones around the Mediterranean, from Valerian Gallienus all the way through to Diocletian, 14,000 or so. The Gallic Empire, north of the Alps, posthumous through to Tetricus, and all of you will find Gallic Empire coins are posthumous, Victorinus, and Tetricus. They're common. And as I say, Vincent is doing the Victorinus as I speak, about 8 to 9,000 of them. Uh, these common, and then the most important group, the British Empire, which is now up to 850 the largest single group of coins of Carasis ever found in a board. So that's the significance, and he made from about 250 to 290. Now, it makes it the second largest board ever found in Britain. The largest was Kineto still from two containers. This is only one. And then Norman becomes in. There's another hoard found in Northamptonshire, about 40,000, which has never been published properly. Um, but these are monster hordes. There are not many bigger in the empire. It's in the top 20 easily. Um, the earliest coins of Valerian. This is Valerian. He's the chap who fought the Sasanian Persians and got captured. Here he is being captured by Shapur. He was then promptly used as a mounting stool by the Persian king whenever he got on the horse. And when he died, he was stuffed, painted red, and put in a temple. Um, <laughs> His coins go green because they're only about 15% silver. Already we have heavy debasement. Um, but it is a time of Valerian and his successors of amazing conflict between Rome and barbarians. And this sarcophagus in um, Rome shows you the Romans defeating the barbarians at this time. But often you have to turn it upside down because the barbarians defeating the Romans. And that gives you an idea of what's happening. Rays from the east, this is the Persians, Goths and others coming over the Danube, and you've got all sorts of Germans coming across the Rhine as well. The Romans lose Mesopotamia, Dacia, or Romania, and the Agrodeptimates, much of modern Austria at the time as well. It's a serious problem in the two cities and centuries. The Roman Empire almost collapses, it is that close. But as a result of the raids in the north, the uh, Roman army north of the Alps rebels. They say to the Central Empire, you're not protecting us. Almost like the, the um, colonials in America, no taxation without representation. In this case, it was no taxation without protection. And so they uh, appointed their own emperors, in this case Posthumus was the first one, and he then led the defense of the Northern Empire, the Gallic Empire, as it's called, against the barbarians from his capital at Trier, which, if you haven't been to Trier, is a really good trip on the best Roman sites north of the Alps. Um, that is the Gallic Empire, and of course, Britain is part of it. Hence, we have a lot of coins in the hold. And by the time we get to Tetris the first and second, the two seventies, what had been a coin of fifty percent silver under Caracalla fifty years earlier is now a coin of one percent silver. And they're striking over a million a day of these at two minutes. An enormous quantity. Now, you all probably know, and you can, off the top of your heads, I know you will know the most common penny of the 19th, 20th century was. 
Very good. 1917. And it was about uh, over 100 million struck. So they were striking about 300,000 a day. Gives you an idea of the sheer quantity of these coins that have been struck. So a lot more of these were struck a day than even the 1917 penny, which was the most common. I've never understood, as an aside, why it was 1917, because you would have thought the copper there would have been more important for munitions and shell cases and everything, but hey. Um, now, so this is a massive amount of radiates being struck. And these coins, as I say, over 30,000 of the coins are Gallic Empire coins. But with the demise of Tetricus, and he was defeated by um, Aurelian, he actually surrendered and became a governor in southern Italy, one of the few people who actually survived. Uh, Aurelian took over and he upped the silver content of the coins to 5%. And that's what this 20xx and 1 means, 21. 20 parts copper to 1 part silver, so 5% silver. And you can see the silver sheen to the coin because they used to enrich the surface to make it look really silver. And this coin shows the sun god and refers to the, uh, the rising of the emperor in the east. It's a lot of different mixed messages here. And he actually worshipped the sun god and built a temple to him in, in um, Rome. But he also, as well as claiming Tetricus, he also took Queen Zenobia of Palmyra, who rebelled in the east, and taken much of the eastern Roman Empire, he conquered her. Now, this is a slight irony, nothing to do whatsoever with the fruit board, and you'll think, why am I mentioning it? That is one of the latest photographs ever taken of the Temple of Bell at Palmyra. I took it in March 2011. When I was in Palmyra then, the rebellion had started, and the political prison was rioting in Palmyra. We were in Lebanon within a few days. Um, <coughs> hardly any Westerners has got to Palmyra after we did, when we questionably ran. And so it's a poignant photograph, that one. Of course, Palmyra's in the news now for some pretty horrible reasons. Um, Aurelian was the one who built the walls around Rome. If you all read Rome, or one or two of you, uh, whenever you go in and out of the walls of Rome, it's Aurelian. So he did actually really shore up the empire. One of his successors, who I just mentioned, Probus, uh, this is Probus here as a consul, wearing a consular garb with a, a scepter, and he's even got Medusa on his breastplate underneath his consular robes. And this uh, is the time when we're told that he granted permission to all the Gauls, the Spaniards, and the Britons to plant vines. Now, this is because those barbarians I've been talking about have ravaged Germany and Gaul. A lot of the vineyards would have been ripped up and destroyed, etc. So, Probus is saying, look, I don't mind how you produce the stuff, just produce it. And this doesn't just really refer to wine. Alcohol obviously was an importance. It also refers to general foodstuffs. And um, this is what we're going to find at this time in the reign of Probus. This little plough team from uh, County Durham is quite relevant to it. And it gives some background to this board. This, um, he's wearing a British hoodie. Now, I know David Cameron was quite rude about hoodies, wasn't he, or something like this? And people were going on about hoodies being the, the symbol of the breakdown of British society. Well, you could not wear a more British item of clothing. Because the hoodie is known in the ancient world as the Birus Britannicus, the British cloak. It was so famous in the empire that it was one of only two products which in Diocletian's pricing of 8301 was mentioned. So if you went to Turkey to Aphrodisias, where they had a big inscription on the wall that would tell you the maximum price for a British duffel coat, because that's what it is, is £150 in modern money. So anyone who's rude about a hoodie in future, correct them, please. But this is a time when Britain's agriculture was beginning to boom. Now, not in Hertfordshire. I'm afraid Hertfordshire is a bit of a sad story um, because your villas never really developed. And they all collapsed in the 4th century. I don't know what it is, it's just something about Hertfordshire villas. They never get to the big time like Rockwall and Chedworth, Woodchester, all the great villas of the West Country. In Hertfordshire, they all go belly up early on. And in fact, on the coin record, your villas have a more urban profile than St Albans, Berylania. That's how weird they are. So, you know, I know, I'm not saying you're odd in your uh, heart, whichever your villas are. But, 
in most of the country, the West Country, north up around the Fens, Lincolnshire, East Yorkshire, agricultural output starts to take off. Villas start to grow. And this is all because we're beginning to feed the Roman army on the Rhine. And that's the backdrop to this point. Now, before I get to the British bit, we have one two other interesting ones. This is the coin of Carus. Has anyone here found a coin of Carus? No. They are really rare. <coughs> There's only about a dozen found on database. We get them in hordes a bit more. But any of these most recorded <coughs> radiators will really demand are scarce. These coins are really rare in Britain. If you get one, you've done really well. They're rarer than some of the so-called really rare coins of the earlier period, <coughs> like Galba, Arpo, and Vitellius. But this one is Devo Caro. He's died. On the back, it's got an eagle, which is the standard symbol of the spirit or the, the soul of the dead emperor, with the inscription consecration, consecratio, which is self-explanatory. And this is because when the emperor died, You'd have the funeral part, the big wedding cake, so to speak. He'd be on top of an effigy of him and whatever, and he'd be lying underneath it. And all <coughs> sorts of stuff would be thrown on him. You'd burn it, and as it burned down, some freedman or slave behind a wall nearby would be getting a box out, getting an eagle out, and giving it a good kick into the sky. <laughs> and that eagle would fly off into the sky as the spirit of the emperor. So whenever you look at this point, you think of the dead emperor. But what's interesting about it is I've always wondered did the emperors, when they went on their progress around the empire, have an eagle in a box? <laughs> or did some poor freeman or slave, was he told, you've got to go and find an eagle? Um, the chaps just popped his clocks. I, mean, I don't know. But it's a little bit of that social element of Roman, Roman world we can think about. Now, this wasn't in the horde, but Diocletian was the last central empire emperor to be represented with his co-emperor Maximian. Um, and these, this is Diocletian and the Tetrarchs, the four emperors at the time, Diocletian, Maximian, Constantius, and Galerius, on the corner of St. Mark's and Venice. Has anyone ever seen this? In Venice? Yeah, St. Mark's on the corner? And this came from Constantinople, whence it came from Nicomedia, and the stone was made in Egypt. It was pinched by uh, Constantine from Diocletian's palace of Constantinople, and the Crusaders pinched it from Constantinople back to Venice. Uh, it's been looted several times. But this is the emperor in the West, who we're going to come across in a minute, Maximian. And his co or companion, or protector em uh, god, was Hercules. And he says, Hercules, my protector, on the inscription. And there's Hercules, who's covering his landscape. So these are the latest coins of the Central Empire, up to the 280s. And they stop about 285. Why? Because we have the British Empire. Now we get some important stuff. Carousis. This is not from the Horde, it's from the Ashbourne Horde, found about seven or eight years ago up in Derbyshire. And this is a gold coin. I'm not, don't believe it is real right now, but it's struck from a continental mint. Maybe it's struck in Britain, uh, even in the very early time. But Carousis was a a man who had a naval background from the, he was a Menapian from the estuary of the Rhine region. And we know he was a pilot or he was a helmsman. He went up with the ranks of the Roman army until he became a general. And he was so successful that he was put in charge of the northern fleet, which is a combination of the classic Britannica and the classic Germania. So he's really in charge of a lot to keep out the Saxon Germanic uh, pirates. And he's so successful at the job. Uh, but he's accused of letting the pirates come in, get the loot, on their way out he intercepts them, and he keeps the loot for himself. <laughs> so he gets sentenced to death by Maximian. But Carousis is no idiot, he doesn't hang around to be executed, he rebels instead. And um, he starts to strike his early coins on the continent. I think it a moving mint. Who's found Mark Antony and Argus here? Good, you've got one, two. You know, the very warm with the ship and the... Those coins were struck in the Aegean area in the last year when Mark Antony and Cleopatra were about to have the big showdown at the Battle of Actium with Augustus, or then Octavian. And those coins were struck on the move. If you're campaigning, do you leave your mint vulnerable somewhere? You keep it with the army. <clears throat> and that's almost certainly what Carousius did. And this mint was moving with him. Now, the early coins, which are called Ruan, because a big horn was found in Ruan in the Victorian period, there's only one coin from Fru, which is this consular coin, you can see holding the scepter again. 
nothing like as nice as the Progress Club. <coughs> Why? Because he doesn't have a professional dining grave to make his coins. There's no mint in Northern Gaul. The mint of Lyon, when he rebelled, was closed <coughs> and moved over the Alps so that they couldn't get hold of it. So he has to start from scratch. So he gets uh, from blacksmiths, other metal workers, anyone he gets hands on, uh, gem engravers, anyone, jewelers, to start making coins for him. So the first coins are pretty crude, but they get better fairly quickly. And this is another one of the concert address, again with Medusa's head on the front, just like the others. Um, so it starts to look like an emperor. But what it tells us is that he makes himself consul as soon as he rebels. He's going to be an emperor like anyone else. We'll see that later. Now, when he comes to Britain, it was traditional at this time. I, some of you, if you go back and look at your coins, your radiates, and if you've got any Aurelian or later, you might have one with an emperor on a horse and the inscription Adventus. And this is the coin that was struck to celebrate the emperor's first visit to Rome, because at this time they weren't sitting in Rome, they were emperors all over the place. And when they finally had a chance to come to Rome, they had a coinage which had Adventus, the arrival of the emperor, hence Advent in the Christian calendar in December. Now, Carousis can't do Adventus to Rome. He goes to London, though, and he does Adventus into London instead. So this is an Adventus coin. This is one of the five silver denarii. It is the finest coin of its type. There are about 50 of these known. This is by far the best example. Absolutely beautiful. And he also has this coin which has on an expectate baby. Welcome a long-awaited one. This is from Virgil's Aeneid. And it's basically uh, saying Carousius has come to Britain and he is the saviour. And of course, what's he doing? Here he is standing, I like to think of the White Cliffs of Dover, shaking the hands of none other than Britannia. A great propaganda, this, and it gets better too. And um, then you will see that uh, as Guy de la cracked the code about 15, 20 years ago. RSR underneath. This has been exercising numismatists since 1700, what it means. Um, but actually, he Googled these letters and came up with um, bits of Virgil again. And it's Rodea and Saturnia Regna, the golden age of Saturn returns. And we in the museum have this medallion with IMPCBA, which is Jan Nova Bregenius Cairo Domitator Alta. Not Latin lesson, don't worry. But now a new generation comes down from heaven above. And what this means is basically in Virgil's Eclogues, the golden age of Saturn returns, now a new generation comes down from heaven above. So Carousis is the start of the golden age in Britain. Amazingly good uh, propaganda. The first and pretty well only Roman emperor to make exclusive use of ancient classical poets on its point. And in fact, it was used again later. When Charles II came to the throne, I just meant you had a William and Mary hanging, wasn't you? Mm. And I saw a George II. I didn't see a Charles II, no, because you don't normally get Charles II hating you normally get the farthings, don't you? They're more common. But, but here is a Charles II hating uh, with Britannia on the back. The first time that Britannia was reintroduced was in his reign, since the end of the 3rd century AD. In fact, this was modelled on one of his mistresses. <laughs> Having also, though, this wonderful print, Richard Abney, my colleague at the BM, discovered this, has the same inscription above the uh, throne of Charles II, saying the golden age returns again. And they probably thought they were really clever putting this up here, not realizing it had been done by someone for Carousis many centuries earlier. Now, we have other things that Carousis does. Connected with the golden age is a famous Roman game is called the Secular Games. Again, if you go look at some of your coins, you might find that you've got secular or seculares on the back of the inscription. If anyone's got a Philip Antonianus or Radiate, you might have an animal on the back with the word secular. This is a game that was basically, uh, goes back to Etruscan times, but Augustus made it a, a famous game, which was to celebrate the rebirth of Rome. And it was then celebrated at different intervals afterwards depending on which calendar people followed, but in about 100 years different, sometimes 80 years. And Carousis decides it's time to hold them, and he's going to hold it in Britain. So the most Roman festival that you could possibly hold is held by him, and it involves gladiatorial combat and animal fights. So this coin, which is unique, the only one known from a board, shows a, a stag 
and Saculares Augusti, the secular games of the emperor. Um, so he's also doing something which is more Roman than the Romans. And he even goes as far as striking this particular coin, which shows um, the Wolf and Twins, and it's basically Renewer of the Romans, or Renewer of Rome. This is the most beautiful <coughs> coin, about 80 of these know. Again, a very potent image. It's almost like um, William Blake and his Jerusalem. I won't let my hand rest until England, uh, Jerusalem's been um, built in England's green and pleasant land. It's that sort of symbolism. And this coin shows you Roma herself, it's, the inscription is to the eternal Roma. She's sitting here uh, as a warrior goddess, handing over victory to Carousius. So he's saying, I'm really Roman. And that coin also is unique, uh, another one. And this particular one is a, uh, a jubilee coin, two in the hoard. And this was, wasn't known until very recently, this coin. And it shows you, again, Roma holding Sandy victory to Carousius. And it basically says in English, uh, well done on five years of rule, looking forward to your ten years. That's the way they did Jubilee coins in those days. Some of you must have got a Vot Mult coin. Vot X Mult 20. Which is, I rule for ten years and I'm looking forward to my twenty. And so this is a Jubilee coin of his, which dates the hoard to around about 290-291. But then he goes even further. This is the only decent specimen of this coin in existence. And it says he's chief priest, part of tribute for the second time, consul, and father of the fatherland. And he's sitting on a curral chair, which is the consular chair, <coughs> with a globe as Rector Orbis, ruler of the world, and um, a scepter. Basically, in this case, he is being shown as being ruler of all. So Carousius, although he's only ruling in Britain, he is really making this point that I am the, the top dog. I'm a Roman emperor like anyone else. And he also does things which Roman emperors do at Rome at festivals. Liberalitas of the Augusti, which basically means the, um, the generosity uh, of the emperor. And what he's doing here is he's sitting on a dais. There's a person coming up here, up a ladder, and he's handing out money to them. This is a personification of Liberalitas, and she's holding a coin shaker. When they went in the chariots, the emperor would shake out coins around them, and everyone would be running around to pick them up off the ground. And so this is showing him as an emperor giving out money, just like an emperor would in a festival. The other side is probably the finest military portrait of Carousius, half-length bust, Medusa's head, shield, spear, uh, wonderfully carved. This man is a brute of an emperor, a brute of a warrior. Now his coinage, and we learn a lot from this hoard and from other finds, gold is very rare. 26 of them now. He ruled for seven years, and we only have 26 gold coins in existence of his. That's how rare they are. If you get one, and a single one, you get it to the ASAP. Um, silver used to be 150 known in the 1970s. Now, because of what you've lost doing, 360. It's going up. They're still rare, but they are, we now know, at least 85 to 90% silver. They are the best quality silver coins that have been struck in 200 years. Nothing like them elsewhere in the empire at the time. And this is almost certainly because he's not got enough of this stuff up here to pay his followers, so he's having to use silver instead. And I think those hordes from North Wales are there because a lot of the silver is coming from North Wales and Petra, <coughs> as is copper. The early coins in the hoard are unmarked, and Froome has them, and the two most common types are Pax, 70% of his coins issued in his entire reign of Pax, and Moneta, which is, he's celebrating the fact he has a mint, he can make money. And we also get a few forgeries, or are they forgeries? The, the, I think they probably are copies, but they also could be the work of inexperienced die engravers in a mint, where you have people starting from scratch. And then you have this very rare coin with BRI, Britannia. I know 12 of these in existence, mm -hmm. one in the forward. A very, very short-lived mint mark early in the reign. And then he kicks into having the proper mint mark, so Moneta Londiniensis, MLs, <coughs> ML here. And they, can you see the slight sheen on them? Mm -hmm. The silver content is going up now. 
And you can see here, the cement, likewise, the silver content, when the cement starts, it goes up as well. And then you get this coin, which uh, numismatists like putting everything in order. There's a geek element to numismatics. And the CXXI is put quite late in the series for Carousers, because it's supposed to be matching a London mark. But actually, I've shown in the proof of all that this is actually earlier. These coins are struck very soon at the start of the reign. <coughs> And you can see that it's been nicely silvered. And that's one thing about the Froome Hall's coins. These coins are horrible when they were unconserved. They are brown, blotchy blobs. When they're cleaned up, they look lovely. And you can see here, this is the Foxtrot Oscars FOs. Lots of those. And that O is almost a gamma. And this coin shows a gamma coin struck over an F coin. Uh, you can see it's a double struck or overstruck, and that shows you that the gamma is an official mint mark, rather than being a copy, which is what people previously thought. Then you get this coin, which is a, a very odd one. I need to have metallurgical analysis done on this, but it's a, I think it's a half denarius. It's much more silver. And I actually found in an 18th century manuscript a picture of this very coin here. Same coin. And this is a man called Morris Johnson, who founded the Spalding Gentleman Society in Lincolnshire, and the, he was one of the founders of the Society of Ant Antiquaries. And if you'd gone around London in the early 1700s, and you stopped someone on the street, and you said, do you know Carousius? Chances are, they would say yes. Because at this time, Britain was faced with imminent invasion from mainly Catholic Europe on the continent. And this is what Johnson wrote. He said, Virtus Org, or Car the Courageous Emperor, is a frequent compliment to this great and very brave prince, well deserving from the Britons whom he delivered and preserved by his courage and conduct from the insolent tyranny of Diocletian and the avaricious cruelty of Maximian. Carousius and his successor Electus were poster boys of British independence. Uh, they really were powerful symbols of defiance to the extent that they could actually be the um, UK. <laughs> but uh, Nigel Farage never got this one. Uh, as far as the army goes, Carouse is very, very keen on honouring his army. And this is the coalition coin, Concordia Militum, harmony with the army and the two class hands. That is my favourite coin in the whole war. Look at that portrait. You wouldn't want to meet him in a dark alley. <laughs> and he then honours Legio II Augusta, the legion with the Capricorn, and this is Caerleon where they were based in Wales. But we know that by the end of the 4th century, they've been moved to Richborough in Kent. And I've been doing, now I'm rewriting the RIC volume for Carousers and Electors, and I've been down to Dover Castle since I was last here to look at the Richborough coins. They've got about 1,500 coins of Carousers and Electors there. And um, they have a very large number of this particular coin in their center. <coughs> and I just wonder if it wasn't Carousers who moved Legio to, to Richborough. A uh, bit more evidence. But these are the legions in the honoured, and now we've also got Legio VI as well. And these are all legions who probably had units with him when he rebelled, and they stayed with him when he came to Britain. So he's honouring these legions. He also honours his fleet, and this is a silver coin showing uh, a galley, and this coin honouring legion, which is really a marine legion by this thing. You can imagine this legion being used on, in the fleet, because it's got Neptune and the Dolphin, the Legio 30 Ulpia, on it as well. Um, and he even goes as far as one coin we've got in our collection of putting Oceanus on the other side with the crab claws on his head. And those of you who know Verilami Museum, you've got a god that they call Canunus with the claws. I'm not sure he ate him, Oceanus, so if the label's not corrected by the time I come up there, I'll <laughs> tell the young Thorold that he'll get a whipping. Um, but no, there, um, this is Oceanus, who is probably his protector god. And then two unique coins from the hoard. Again, this one says that he's Placator Orbis, a pacifier of the world. And there he is with a sphere and a globe. Pretty powerful message. And this one says that his co mate is none other, his companion protector goddess is victory. So he really is pushing the message out, and this is a wonderful arm and bust of him. I think you're getting the message now about this person. I mean, this is a propaganda campaign beyond, uh, <coughs> and I say this board is just so exceptional. 
That is Richborough, which I now think is probably built by Christmas. <coughs> and I think a lot of these ports, Porchester, uh, we know Porchester's crowds here, uh, Pevens is his successor electors. I think that some of these ports here, uh, Richborough, Dover, and Lynn, especially, are possibly crowds as well. They're being, re uh, being fortified against the uh, invading enemy. Uh, this is Porchester, you all know Porchester. Dover, you've got the Faros, which are almost certainly going to be the lookout point at this stage as well. And this shows you how there's a big move to the southeast from the north. There are currently crowds found up here, but nothing like as many as you get down in the southeast, and this is your data. And it's showing that the, now the focus of defense is against the continent. And that's because Maximian, the emperor I mentioned earlier, prepares a massive fleet of invasion. And I won't read all this out, but it's basically a praising poem to him, saying how wonderful you are, and all these wonderful ships that you're building to invade Britain. Well, this is very much 1940 all over again, waiting for the invasion. You didn't know about this, did you? It's new, isn't it? It's great. But why won't we talk this at school? We had all this going on then. It's much more interesting than talking about some of the other Roman stuff we get taught. Everyone's talking about bars and all the rest of it. Hey. Anyway, what we hear afterwards is, one panegyric says, war was abandoned in despair. And another one says, peace through the range of carousers after military operations against his expert traffickers have been attempted without success, i.e. carousers transfer. It is the first time that a British fleet had been used to destroy an invading army. <coughs> it wasn't Henry VIII who built the Royal Navy, it was Carousis. It's the first time a British fleet defends our shores. Let's put their record straight on that one. And the last coins in the board are the Bravo Echo coins, the BE ones. We don't know what these mean. I think it could be bonus event, a good event. But the interesting thing about this is, in London, these are the last London coins, MLXXI. Um, it has <coughs> in Carouses, Pius Felix, uh, Pius the Gods, Vesta the Gods, Augustus Emperor. Okay, fine. <coughs> Until they get strong enough to wipe them out later. And so, why does Seamint gives him the title of Caesar? He's got 15 points from Seamint. Not one London coin gives him the Caesar title. And I think this helps to explain where the Seamint was, because it's the biggest conundrum in Carousian studies. People have said Camelodunum, Colchester, Corinium, Sirencester, they said uh, Corsopitium, Corbridge, they said Capturahonium, Catrick, Clausentum, which is uh, down near Southampton, all sorts of theories. And they're all wrong. And it could be, see, the classes. Some of the electors points of his successor, successor had CL on. But I think what this mint is doing is it's moving with the emperor still. Carouse is, throughout his reign, has to keep his defensive all the time against potential invasion. <coughs> and I think the seaman is the myth that happens to be with his court wherever he is. The coin types are much more personal. And if this myth was with him on the continent when he had this peace treaty or whatever of Krasus uh, with Maximilian and Diocletian, the seaman coins would be the first ones to give him the new title. London doesn't do this. So I think the Prune War has probably shown us that seaman indeed is attached to the emperor. Other people have been suggesting this but I think this is pretty conclusive. That's another one, semen, the didn't see carousers. Um, and this is a hybrid coin of London, suggesting that London didn't quite understand what was going on. Uh, it's a semen with a London mint. When the semen got back to London with the emperor, London scratched its head, and these are very rare. Um, Froome's got the largest number of these coins anywhere, about five of them, which is <coughs> all the equals the other number one would know. Um, but I think this shows again that London's a bit behind. What we don't have is the famous coin of Krauses and his brothers. One of these is flying in Buckinghamshire recently. Like There's quite a few around now. They're not that rare. There's about 20, 30 now. Um, but this is him with Maximian and Diocletian. Uh, it's a bit of a cheeky coin. I don't think it went down well with the Central Empire. But what happened in 293 was, though, the Central Empire decided they were strong enough now to take on Krauses. And so they appointed Constantius Chlorus, the junior emperor in the West, and his task was to get rid of Carousis. The first thing was he took Boulogne, which Carousis had probably been captured uh, as a result of defeating Maximian. And we're not sure if it's Carousis or his successor who lost Boulogne. But what we do know at this time is that Carousis got um, assassinated, we're told, 
And so the henchman killed his pirate chief, no longer afraid of punishment for the remote share, and thought his crime would be rewarded by imperial power. So his right hand man is to assassinate him, and hoping he'll get favour with the continental off. And he was Electus. And Electus <coughs> was none other than Corrales as his chancellor. <laughs> <laughs> And there is Gordon Brown with a plastic spring knife having a go at Tony Blair with the front benches. The history repeats itself. So, he then becomes emperor, he builds Pevensey. This again, as detectives, this will interest you because the landscape that you detect on is not the same as it was in the ancient period, remember. All sorts of different things happen. This was all seen around here and around here, except for the entrance here, that's the little land bridge. All of that was seen. So that's how things change in the ancient period up to now. But Electus held out for two or three years until uh, a two-pronged attack was led by Constantius. His general Asclepiodotus came in through the Isle of Wight. The British fleet waiting didn't see them because of the fog. Asclepiodotus lands, takes on Electus' army, defeats it, and kills Electus. And meanwhile, Constantius comes up the Thames with his uh, fleet and takes London, here in London. This is a wonderful gold medallion found in Gaul at Arras. We have a metroplite in the museum on display. And it talks about the return of the eternal light, Roman Empire coming back to Britain. And the panegyric at the time also says the Britons were so pleased to see the Romans back <laughs> in disgust. Um, but to end up with, there's one or two little interesting things in this book. One of the things in the panegyric says is Britain was routed out and the understate ill afford to do so plentiful harvest so numerous past lands in which it rejoiced. Our food was crucial. And what Carousis understood about this was that we were a breadbasket. And this coin in the Ashmolean is one of several silver coins showing a milkmaid, a uh, milking cow. And there are a few very bad copper coins of the same type but we have the first semen version <coughs> in the broom board, rather more Disney-like cow, with a, a woman milking a cow there. And this is such a unique coin in the Roman world, just displaying, as it says, the fecundity, the fertility, the abundance of Britain. Carousers knew exactly why Britain was so important to hold. And if you want an example of ancient regime change, it's not pulling down the statue of Saddam Hussein necessarily all the time, when uh, Constantine the Great, as junior emperor, was campaigning in the north with his father against the Picts, they came across this milestone, which has this the only inscription with the name of Carousis, other than on coins, ever found. It's the only stone inscription, and it talks about uh, Carousis here. But what they did was they turned it upside down, and he carved the other end instead. And so that was then discovered, and of course we put it up the right way again now. <laughs> Uh, I finish off though with a tale of two forwards. The forward, and uh, this is where recent evidence, we've been doing recent survey there, it's on as I suspected, because it was boggy ground then, and the farmer said when the field drains got blocked, it was even boggier. I almost certain at the time it was a watercourse, and we discovered there was certainly an ancient watercourse there, and there's still a spring, and this was buried in very boggy ground, and there's another coin forward as well. And it's almost certainly this is a ritual deposit. It was buried in one go. And why do we know one go? Well, if you look at the stratigraphy of the pot, this is why whenever you find a Roman coin hoard now, you will never take it out of the ground again. You will sit on that hoard with your phone, picking up Julian and others, until <coughs> someone comes and rescues you. Because these are the coins of Carousis in the hoard. There's a group right at the top, 1132, and then there's a couple of strays. Then there's a massive group in the middle. The group at the top has a lot of early coins. No semen coins. London, the earliest London, I'll show you those in a minute. The group in the middle has some early, but all the latest coins down here. And so that is telling us that these coins are the latest coins. These ones are earlier. So if it was ticked in over time, it wouldn't have been like that. Because you have later coins towards the top. What has happened here is it's a single event. A whole community probably comes along and they tip separate pots into the pot 
and then they cover it over and they walk away, never to recover it again. And some of the coins on the top are the Newton coins, which are the earliest London mint coins a lot. That's Legio Tracy Chester, this is Legio 1 Minervia, uh, Legio 8 Augusta, and Legio 2 Partica in the Centaur. They're in brilliant condition, but they are the earlier coins of Krauss, not the later ones. And when you look at the little list of the mint marks, I'm doing red ink all over it. I've got a lot more red ink to put on that as a result of this board. This board is turning things upside down. It really is changing studies. And if I hadn't had this board under the new ROC, it would be very sad. It's very lucky the gods were on my side. Um, so, that is the largest group of his coins found. Oh, obviously, the board in its own right is important. It is incredibly important because it has such a large number of coins of Krauss, who is our emperor. But also, it is incredibly important because the finder let us dig it out of the ground. As a result, we've got all that stratigraphic information. And we still don't know what that's going to tell us about the other coins yet, because we're still working through them. So it is a big, big find. I think on that note, I'm going to shut up. I know some of you have been looking at your watches. A few of you fall and sleep and wake up now. <laughs> uh, and uh, I'm happy to take questions, but I know you've got other business to get on with, and I probably need to get back to London very quickly. But well, my visa runs out. Mm. Okay? Any quick questions? Thank you very much. Thank you.